Well, I want to start by thanking Richard and Teresa for inviting me to speak. And what I'm going to say is actually very much influenced by a question that Richard asked Peter Singer at the first Minding Animals Conference in Australia in 2009. Some of you may remember the question. While some of the big names in animal studies seem to be congratulating each other on their personal achievements in terms of animal welfare, Richard asked a pointed intersectionality question. Why had animal liberation been unsuccessful in improving the conditions of life for non-human animals? Was it that it had failed to address how the oppression of animals is tangled up with other oppressions? Might these also need confronting? Peter Singer appeared amused. Why? We should be acting for animals, not tackling global capitalism. We need, however, to do both. In the aftermath of this exchange, some of us discussed Peter Singer's need, and perhaps critical animal studies need, for some sociology. And the focus of what I'll say here is that both sociology and critical animal studies have been improved with a little more interaction. Now, while sociology is, I suppose, my discipline, I have something of a fraught relationship with it. Talking about non-human animals has proven difficult for a discipline whose boundaries were historically constituted around the designation of an arena, the social, which was defined as exclusively human. We need, I would suggest, a sociology which is not human exclusive and acknowledges the way that species shapes the human and non-human life world as part of the condition of life. In this sense, sociology needs animal studies as a corrective to its limitations, to paint a more convincing picture of social lives, which are those of multi-species. Sociology cannot continue to produce work on the body, on labour, or on the family, for example, which assumes that all bodies or workers are exclusively human and that we dwell in single species households. The conventional trilogy of social domination, of class, race and gender, that's been the focus of critical sociological approaches to matters of oppression and exclusion, has been challenged by new concerns with other differences of place and location, of age and generation, sexuality and so on. But despite these important developments, most sociology stops short at the difference of species. And it is time, I think, for sociologists of a more critical persuasion to consider seriously the difference of species in social relations. In turn, animal studies might benefit from the insights of a critical sociological framework. The concept of speciesism has been a great significance in raising political questions about the use and treatment of non-human animals. It's a foundational concept for more critical approaches in animal studies and has introduced an analysis of power and inequity into discussions of human-animal relations. However, critical animal studies has been over-dependent on this behaviourist concept developed within moral philosophy. Speciesism is not adequate for capturing the full range of our social relations with non-human animals. A critical and sociological analysis can provide us, I think, with the tools for theorising species relations in terms of human domination, exploitation and oppression. And it will also help us to remain sensitive to differences in the kinds and degrees of human practices. So what might a critical social... Sorry, what might a critical sociology of species look like? I'm going to suggest that it must account for both the discursive and the material placement of animals. It must interrogate institutional contexts and related practices. It should consider the extent to which these change and or reconstitute themselves over time. The argument I make focuses particularly on those species with which I've been personally most concerned whose lives I think humans have very urgently shaped, domesticates. I'll argue that in this case, species difference means human domination, and I'll end with a brief discussion of my own model of human domination as a complex system of social relations which privileges the human, but within which different degrees of domination of non-human species might be found, dependent on social context.
So let us begin by considering sociology, animal studies, and the engagements between the two. Sociology has generally held to the conceptions of those foundational figures, such as George Simmel and Emil Durkheim, of a society that emerges, to quote John Scott, through the symbolically constituted and linguistically mediated encounters and interactions through which meanings and representations are communicated from one mind to another in the course of human association. So it's only fairly recently that influential voices have been heard to argue for the radical reconfiguration of the discipline. For Bruno Latour, for example, sociology must fully embrace the world of non-human beings, objects and things and the ways in which our lives are constituted with them. The bringing in of animals as a new subject of sociological study has been via two routes, however, both critical and more mainstream. On the one hand, we have the development of a sociology which simply includes non-human animals in specific areas of sociological inquiry. On the other hand, a more reflective of other critical traditions in sociology we have sociological animal studies which raise questions about the exploitation and oppression of non-human animals. Whilst the notion of species suggests taxonomic classification of kinds, types or varieties, it's also, of course, as we well know, a social assignation. And interrogating naturalised categories has actually been an important sociological preoccupation. Sociology lends itself to problematising the human-non-human binary and the ways it's played out in social formations in similar ways that it is done in terms of gender, race and so on. In addition, species is constituted by and through human hierarchies. Ideas of animality and of nature are vitally entangled in the constitution of race, gender, class and other human differences with which critical sociologists have well-established preoccupations. However, in sociology, it seems, we are expected to study people and not other creatures. There is, as Janet Alger points out, a hard line that sociology has always drawn between humans and other species. Arnold Arluk has noted that there are very real barriers to the acceptance of animal studies as a research area. And even critical sociologists are very resistant to the study of animals, shaped by the belief that studying other animals lessens or undermines the notion of oppression that we might apply to groups of humans. Contesting the androcentrism of sociology has been an important element in the development of sociological animal studies. Some have been drawn, for example, to Max Weber's notion of a Verstein perspective, where the student of sociology attempts to put themselves in the shoes of others. In her ethnography of an animal shelter, for example, Leslie Irvin argues that our relationships with companion animals involve non-humans participating in the creation of human identities as we develop, as she puts it, and prior to Donna Haraway putting it, incidentally, a sense of self in relation. Whereas George Herbert Mead held that non-human animals sit outside sociology due to an inability to perceive, imagine and speak, thus rendering them incapable of socially meaningful behaviour, sorry, meaningful behaviour, Irvin suggests that some animals and some humans share both meanings and communications, and therefore this does not happen. <laughs> um, and animals, she says, can be the proper subjects of sociological inquiry. Sociologists like Irvin have undertaken grounded studies that investigate the problem of conflating social systems with the human use of language. And of course, as we well know, as Derrida suggests, our understanding of the world would be ruptured if we thought that animals might be able to communicate in ways similar to those in which humans do. But what Arlu calls the androcentrism of sociology far predates Mead. It can be seen as foundational for this discipline, which emerged with a specific mission of countering biological explanations in social life and is thus wary of engagement with non-human animal life worlds or nature. In this sense, studying animals and our relations with them, to use Ted Benton's words, is to redefine the disciplinary matrix of sociology. It is to undermine its dualistic organising categories. But how do we deal with these tricky categories? 
Do we interrogate them, refine them, and continue to deploy them with all their imperfections, or do we abandon them? The Western conception of the human as an autonomous rational being, able to make decisions and choices about actions, has only developed in, contra in contradistinction to the animal. Various philosophical interventions in animal studies have sought to problematise and rework the classical binary formulations of the human-animal distinction. Matthew Kalako pushes further, arguing for the abolition of the guardrails of the human-animal distinction. But I think, however, this is a step too far. Whilst Kalako invites an attractive alternative imaginary, in the social world, species is a powerful and persistent discursive and material distinction. How have sociologists, then, intervened in this category debate? Ted Benton challenges the presumption of human separateness from other animals by arguing, and in pretty classical Dominion fashion, really, that we should think about differentiations rather than differences between animal species. Differentiations of species, and particular social, economic, and ecological contexts, give rise to different categories of human-animal relationship. This leads Benton to a sociological categorisation of other animals in terms of their form of relation to humans. Certain non-human animals may be labourers of various kinds, from guarding and pulling to guiding visually impaired humans. Some species will be food and resources for human clothing and shelter. A limited number may be companions, and many are wild, and what he means by this is outside or in limited incorporation into human social practices. In addition, Benton categorises animals as human entertainment in hunting, shooting, fishing and fighting, as cultural symbols and as human edification, for example, in wildlife documentaries. Benton uses these categories in arguing that animals and humans stand in social relationships to each other, that animals are constituted of human societies and that these relationships are incredibly varied across time and space. These relationships, he says, are fundamental to the structuring of human relations. <clears throat> Although this categorisation, to my mind, is very useful, it, under, it undermines the contingency of animal social location. Matthew Cole and Kate Stewart have emphasised the instability of the categorisation of animals in social relations. So they consider different types of human-animal relation in terms of the level of instrumentality and the level of cultural visibility. Judgments of utility and category membership are contingent and socially constructed, as evidenced by the cultural and historical variability in both the species and the individual animals assigned to particular types. Any quasi-subjectivity a species of animal might achieve is precarious. For example, all pets are not universally recognised by all humans as individual subjects. It's a consequence of a particular kind of relationship with a particular set of humans, the owners. In these attempts to categorise non-human animals in terms of social relations, human power is foregrounded. Whilst the abandonment of categories might seem attractive by virtue of being radically transgressive, under current social arrangements, the categories into which animals are placed are a description of the material world which animals inhabit. In the web of social practices and institutions which non-human animals, particularly those we have domesticated, are very much caught, the differentiations of species have real effects on the lives and deaths of non-human animals. For a critical sociology of species, we need the problematic human-animal distinction as the basis both of an analysis of social forms through which animals are dominated, and also of a politics that contests such humanocentrism. Now, one important way in which species has been drawn into sociology has been in terms of understanding the process of historical change in, in formations of human relations with non-human animals. Historical accounts of map-changing attitudes towards animals, accompanying the dramatic transitions to European modernity, from relations of dependency, contingency and religious-inspired anthropocentricity, to those of distance, sentimentality and ambivalence in more secular times. Following the venerable transitions models of sociologists such as Tonnerre, Simmel and Durkheim, 
Some sociologists have used modernity as a framework for theorising human relations with non-human animals. The least controversial of accounts here, certainly from the viewpoint of the sociological mainstream, are those which consider human relations with other animals to be revealing about human beings themselves. Here, non-human animals are seen as sociologically relevant, and an apparently neutral position is articulated on the quality of species relations. Keith Tester, for example, concentrates on the imposition of social relationships through regulation of human relations with other animals. He draws on the work of Norbert Elias in suggesting that the development of anti-cruelty legislation, for example, was part of a civilising process to discipline the working class in countries such as Britain. The changes in how we think of and act towards animals does not tell us about the ontological condition of animals or about our relations with them, it tells us about ourselves. So, for example, Tester says, animal rights claims are nothing to do with any concern for sufferings humans may inflict on animals. They're about humans making themselves feel good as moral agents, arguing for those who cannot argue for themselves. So Tester offers us an account of human-animal relations which is clearly sociological, but is also highly anthropocentric, and of little help, I think, in considering the, speci the specificity of human relations with animals. Because in Tester's analysis, you could replace animals with any other marginalised social group. A less anthropocentric account of modernity is provided by Adrian Franklin. He contends that we've seen significant changes in species relations very recently, because the categorical boundary between human and other animal species has been challenged with post-modernisation. Whereas modernity defined humans as rational, capable of self-improvement and potential goodness, and set up clear boundaries between humans and other animals, <coughs> As we move towards post-modernity in the late 20th century, he says that misanthropy has become a feature of contemporary social life as we collectively reflect on our destruction of the natural world. Animals, he says, in post-modernity are associated with a sense of risk, and this can be seen in food scares or concerns about the preservation of endangered species. Finally, he says that individuals suffer ontological insecurity due to a depletion of family ties and sense of community. Changes in domestic relations, such as increased divorce rates and remarriage, and changes in patterns of employment with the development of flexible labour markets, higher employment and less job security. Consequently, Franklin suggests that people look to relationships with pets, for example, to provide stability and a sense of permanence in their lives. So he argues overall that we're developing increasingly empathetic and dissented relationships with other species, and this can be evidenced across a range of sites of human-animal relations, from entertainment to food, pet keeping to hunting. There are a number of difficulties here. First, Franklin makes some significant and empirically unsubstantiated assumptions. For example, that certain social changes, like those in the form of the family, have led to certain practices, like more people keeping pets, and that the reason people do so is to provide them with security. Second, whilst human relations with animals have altered in Western societies over the last 300 years, there have been different and competing conceptions of how humans can relate to other animals and both continuity and change in material practices. A picture of a process of increasing sentimentality ignores contradictions embedded in our relationships with animals and the different kinds of relations humans have with specific species. In addition to these particular problems, with these particular theories, it is not sufficient for sociologists merely to say that animals are co-constitutive of human social relations and that these relations change and shift cross-culturally <coughs> and over time. Since the 1970s, such <coughs> um, there has been consideration of the power relations articulated through our relationships with animals, but this has been largely philosophical and in terms of the political language of interests and rights. So Peter Singer, of course, is a name we all know and is much associated with the use of the terminology of liberation and oppression to describe human relations with other animals. The key concept underpinning Singer's contribution is speciesism, this is a parallel to sexism or racism, 
and involves the judgment of an individual group on the basis of group membership and in terms of the hierarchical ranking of groups. Speciesism is the belief that humans are entitled to treat members of another species in ways that it would be deemed morally wrong to treat other humans. In short, speciesism is discrimination based on species membership. Now, in questioning speci speciesism, animal liberation theory has sometimes been preoccupied with the drawing and redrawing of boundaries in deciding which other animals count as ethical subjects. So, Singer, of course, has most of you will all well know, argues that all vertebrate animal groups are sentient and thus have interest, they're able to care about how we use them. Tom Reagan argues that in order to have rights, animals must be the subjects of a life, and this only applies to certain animals with certain similarities to humans. For Gary Francione, this emphasis on similar minds is too limiting. It's a problem of our limited epistemology that we cannot understand the world from a perspective from so many lesser known and lesser liked species. So there is, as Francione suggests, a tendency to measure the extent to which animals do or do not approximate to human capabilities, failing to understand that animals have their own ways of life and being in the world. In turn, however, there has been a difficulty in extending these humanist concepts of rights and interests to the incredible array of different kinds and types that fall under this label, non-human animal. Calarco has convincingly argued that this language of rights, interests, and discrimination in animal rights discourse means we cannot get away from humanocentrism. The similarities between some species and humans are usually foregrounded in extending rights or interest claims. However, the undoubted strength of this kind of theorising about animal rights and interests has been to set an agenda in which the lives and well-being of non-human animals is analytically foregrounded. To consider species as problematic, as socially constituted and as an oppressive category has been a fundamentally important innovation, problematising the certainties and the qualities of human power. Decades have passed since arguments were made for the sentience of animals and the irrationality of the ways in which humans treat them, yet fundamental changes in human relations with non-human animals have been negligible. As Benton argues, the difficulty with the rights and interests discourse of speciesism is its inability to take account of the prevailing social structures and relations apparent in certain places at certain historical junctures. Thus he asserts that under prevailing patterns of animal use and abuse, the notion of rights is not likely to do much to alleviate animal suffering. Now, other work in animal studies, with which I'm sure many of us are very familiar, has not considered speciesism so much as in, in terms of the language of interests and rights, but as a discourse of power. <coughs> so for Carrie Wolf, for example, speciesism has been seen as a set of discourses embedded in a range of texts of popular culture, and occasionally also challenged therein. The discourse of species is understood through such texts. Wolf says reproduces the institution of speciesism. He is attentive to the ways in which, in addition to oppressing animals, this has historically served as a crucial strategy in the oppression of humans by other humans. And this questioning of the way in which overlapping discourses co-constitute forms of domination has a significant legacy in feminist and post-colonial theory, and in particular, eco-feminist work, which is often, I think, rather unacknowledged in some work in animal studies. From the early 1970s, ecofeminists suggested that cultural discourses carry binary normalizations that feminize the environment and animalize women, constructing a dichotomy between women and nature, including the multivarious species of non-human animal and male-dominated human culture. In early works, arguments were made that the social practices of care that women undertake May be more like, mean that they may be more likely than men to oppose practices of harm against non-human animals. Additionally, it's contended that women may empathise with the suffering of animals as they have some common experience. For example, female domestic animals are most likely to be oppressed by control of their sexuality and reproductive powers. Others examine the speciesism of linguistic practices and links between this and our gendered and racialised use of language or look to the interrelations between gender and the environmental and species impact of colonial practices. Such ecofeminist writing has been influential, of course, in alerting us to these intersected qualities of oppression. However, 
and I feel very guilty saying however, because I would never have ended up writing what I've been writing about if Carol Adams hadn't, <laughs> hadn't published her book in 1990, I think, but however. Um, there is a tendency towards conflation in ecofeminist accounts, which can invite criticism for an overgeneral use of a theory of patriarchy, which is presumed to account for a wide range of oppressive relations. So for Carol Adams and Josephine Donovan, for example, patriarchy is prototypical for many other forms of abuse, including that of animals. And Suzanne Kaplan asserts patriarchy is the pivot of all species and racism, ethnicism and nationalism. Val Conwood provides a more satisfactory conceptualisation of gender, nature, race, colonialism and class as interfacing in a network of oppressive dualisms. For Blumwood, these exist as separate entities, but they're also mutually reinforcing in a web of complex relations. This doesn't mean different forms of oppression are indistinguishable, they're distinct, but they're related. Although Conwood considers that oppressions have these distinct foci and strands, as she puts it, she ultimately argues, however, that all oppressions or all forms of domination have a unified overall mode of operation. They are a single system with a common structure and ideology. So both Wolf and Adams and Plumwood have an analysis which is intersectionalized. But their understanding is also ideational. We don't see how these ideas of separation, of human uniqueness, the animal as other, are articulated in historically and culturally located contexts and inform what sociologists would understand as social institutions and related practices. This is a gap, and it's not necessarily one that I'm, I'm criticising Wolf or Adams or Plumwood for failing to fill. But it is time for sociology to step up to the task of outlining the social institutions in which the discourse of species is embedded. It's time for us to provide an analysis in terms of social relations. <coughs> I consider sociology to have made perhaps its most useful contribution to theorising human-animal relations in terms of Marxian-influenced analyses. But these two, surprise, surprise, are not without their difficulties. So David Nibbert specifically uses the concept of oppression in relation to human relations with non-human animals. He argues social institutions are foundational for the oppression of animals. It's not about individual attitudes and moral deficiencies. Nibbert isolates three elements in his model. First, economic exploitation, where animals are exploited for human interests and tastes. Second, power inequalities coded in law, which leave animals open to exploitation. Third, a legitimating ideology which naturalises oppression. Nibbert wants to hang on to the concept of speciesism, but he redefines it to mean a belief system that legitimates and inspires prejudice and discrimination. In turn, this ideology for Nibbert emerges from economic institutions and practices. Contemporary cultural processes and institutional arenas through which animals are exploited and oppressed, zoos, the breeding and keeping pets, the use of animals in research, hunting, farming and slaughter, are all explained in terms of profit creation, corporate interest and the generation and sustaining of false commodity needs. <coughs> Nibbert acknowledges his debt to eco-feminist writers and his understanding of the concept of oppression is very much influenced by its use in feminist theory. He uses um, Iris Marion Young's model. He even appears to endorse a multiple systems model of interlocking and interactive systems of oppression. But disappointingly, the overriding thesis is that the human oppression of other animals is caused and reproduced by the relations of capitalism. Bob Therese applies the Nibbert's model of animal oppression to the case of highly industrialised, capital intensive agriculture in the global north. And here again, capitalism is the crucial analytic tool. Animals are understood as alienated labourers, producing commodities such as milk and eggs, and becoming commodities such as meat and leather. In these commodities, complex chains and networks of productive forces and relations can be found. But animals are not exploited in the same way as human workers in the labour process. Their bodies do not just work for us in order to produce food products, their bodies are themselves commodities. And in addition, animals are property, and this relationship of ownership is essential for the extraction of profit. So whilst the work of those such as Adams, Plumwood and Wolfe is idealist, it focuses on cultural discourses, it's very attentive to interacting with social dominations of gender, race, species, etc. 
Torres and Nimmer, on the other hand, provide us with an analysis which is overwhelmingly materialist, but it leads the oppression of others with the imperatives of capitalism. The concentration on social institutions and the use of a Marxist inflected sociology is a forward step, but we need to retain a sensitivity to other kinds of social relations. So what is needed, I think, is a full analysis of social intersectionality. Uh, social intersectionality. So a critical sociology of species will consider the impacts and effects of various forms of difference, inequality and domination in terms of relational systems of power. We need an analysis of the social practices and institutions which constitute, reproduce and re-articulate the relations of species specifically. And to this end, I shall now turn to the, to the theory I made up on human domination. Well, that's what we do, isn't it, when we theorise, we make stuff up. <laughs> human domination in species relations. Okay. Human relations with other species are constituted by and through social institutions and processes. And these can be seen as sets of relations of power, which are consequential of normative practice. These interrelate to form a social system of human domination that I refer to in a word I made up, anthroparchy. <coughs> so this means that humans have socially formed relational power over other species. In addition, anthroparchy is co-constituted with other forms of complex domination such as patriarchy, capitalism, orientalism. And I'll consider the concept of anthroparchy and intersectionality in turn. <coughs> so human relations with other animals are not a product of class or gender relations. They need to be considered as a system of institutional institutions and practices with their own conceptual repertoire. This notion of anthroparchy is as a system of social domination which inhibits the potential flourishing of an individual, organism, group, micro and macro landscape. Simply put, non-human beings and things are dominated by humans. But this involves different degrees of domination. And I use concepts of oppression, exploitation and marginalisation to describe this. So oppression is useful to describe a harsh degree of relations of dominatory power and its application is species specific. Some species can be oppressed, such as farmed animals, and others cannot, in my view, such as intestinal flora. Exploitation refers to the use of a non-human being as a resource, for example, the use of animals in guarding and herding. And I use the term marginalisation quite generally to refer to humanocentrism, which I prefer to anthropocentrism because I can say it uh, more easily. <laughs> the domination of non-human animals in contemporary Western societies, for example, can be understood um, as constituted through groups of social relations found in particular arenas or sites, and these are the ones I made up as well. Um, so, for example, animal agriculture is an institutional system and a set of production relations endemic to human domination. Different forms of violence against animals can be seen in the killing of animals, the dismemberment of animal bodies, and in practices associated with reproductive control of farmed animals. Huge numbers of a limited range of species are essential forms of property and or labour. Animals are a specific form of embodied property, however, and of course it's the distinction of human from non-human life that's a priori for their commoditisation. So animals produce commodities, which become human food, and they are themselves commodities. And labour, of course, is not simply human property, rather non-human animals labour alongside human labourers. It's unlikely that all animals used by humans experience domination in the same way. The oppressive experiences of farmed animals may be very different from those of prized working animals, such as those providing assistance for humans who are blind, deaf, ill or ageing. The condition of domestication may involve physical confinement, the appropriation of labour and fertility, and incarceration, and these are of course foundational for the farming of animals. Whilst the lives of animals kept as pets are often very different from those of farmed animals, there is of course much evidence of cruelty and ill treatment, neglect and abandonment of animals by their so-called human companions. The industries that have emerged around pet keeping in the West involve intensive breeding and strong genetic selection for the reproduction of desirable breed and other traits. So there are strong similarities in some of the ways in which the processes of domestication 
affect both companion and farmed animals, although those animals may perhaps experience those differently. Institutionalised violence is also systemic. And for species with greater levels of sentiency, this operates in a similar way to violence as affecting humans. For example, animals hunted, trapped, killed <coughs> for food may experience pain and fear. The lives, deaths and dismemberments of animals for meat articulates a range of forms and degrees of physical violence and psychological harms. Finally, anthropomorphic cultures are exclusively humanist or humanocentric, marginalising non-human animals or presenting them in ways that are framed by human interests and reinscribe the norms of human domination. If we return again to the example of meat, the hierarchical ordering of a Western diet is reproduced in the popular culture of cooking and eating, and the eating of animals' bodies is normative. And this process of reproducing human cultural norms is also shaped by various kinds of intrahuman difference, in addition to the distinction of species that enables meat to be eaten. Animal food waste have been relatively stable, unfortunately, and in the West, our representative regime of animals as meat continues to be framed by intersective discourses of difference and power, particularly those constitutive of formations of gender, sexuality and nation. In this social system of species relations, <coughs> centred on human domination, non-human animals have limited agency, that is, the collective capacity to shape their worlds. A sociological account of agency requires that it's understood as socially structured. Options for actors are shaped by social relations. The lives of most farmed animals are so tightly constrained by structures of oppressive power that they cannot exercise agency. Human companions of dogs, for example, and this is only a tiny nod to Don Haraway here, <laughs> may be understood by their owners as agentic beings, they may exercise a very limited agency of a fundamentally unequal but also co-constituted kind, although they live generally precarious lives. <coughs> However, what has happened there? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> How bizarre. Never mind. <laughs> um, the category human is also a problem. It's also a catch-all category. And so the domination of both human and non-human animals is intersectionalised. So I want to give the oppression of animals its own conceptual repertoire, but I also want to model where it is assumed that other systemic relations of social domination will cross-cut. <coughs> And if we consider um, the ways in, in, in which animals are farmed for food, for example, we cannot escape the intersection of colonialist and patriarchal relations. So here we have some blonde cows for, for you, which is a breed, it's a French breed of cow, and it is bred in particular for its docility and in particular because the females are supposed to be incredibly good mothers. And they also look nice. French farmers prefer them. Okay. <coughs> so farmed animals are disproportionately female and they're usually feminized in terms of their treatment by predominantly male human agricultural workers. Farmers disproportionately breed female animals so they can maximise profit by the manipulation of reproduction. Female animals that have been used for breeding can be seen to incur some of the most severe levels of physical violence within the animal food system, particularly at slaughter. Female and feminised animals are bred, incarcerated, raped, killed and cut into pieces in gargantuan numbers by men who are often themselves subjected to highly exploitative working conditions. These conditions are structured by the gender division of labour and also characterised by a culture of machismo. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see if this one works. Oh, no. Oh. <coughs> um, operations of local, regional and global networks of relations in animal food production have been part of a historic process in which the systemic relations of species are constituted with and through relations of colonialism. 
In the 18th and 19th centuries, European countries established a global international system of meat production. Britain and Germany in particular invested in land and later in factories in South America, primarily in Argentina in the 18th century and Brazil in the 19th. The colonial model of meat production was further enabled by the development of refrigerated shipping which made it possible to ship fresh meat to Europe from the USA, South America and Australasia. <coughs> in order to make the best use of this potential market in Europe, the price was minimised by intensifying production and saving labour costs through increased mechanisation, processes which led to the development of intensive agriculture in Europe and the USA. And it is these models of production which we are now currently seeing being spread across the globe with corporate interventions in Asia, Africa and the Caribbean. Finally, doesn't like that one either. <laughs> Finally, a social and natural system to co-constituted. We must also consider the impact of farmed animal agriculture on the worlds of other species and things. As is becoming increasingly recognised, industrialised animal agriculture is claimed to be a driving force behind all the contemporary and pressing environmental problems we face. Deforestation, water scarcity, air and water pollution, climate change and the loss of biodiversity. Thus, while farmed animal agriculture is an integral element of a social system of species relations in which domesticates are oppressed, it is also constituted by relations of capitalism, colonialism and patriarchy, and is shaped by and impacts on other species. In conclusion, <laughs> in its attentiveness to questions of historical change, cultural specificity, the power of ideas and beliefs, and the analysis of concrete social practices. The discipline of sociology has much to offer those who seek to understand our relationships with other animals. I've suggested that a critical sociology of species will understand these relations in terms of power and hierarchy. It will attempt to account for species as both discursively and materially constituted, and as a system of power relations which is intersected by forms of intrahuman difference and domination. A critical sociology of species moves us beyond speciesism as a core concept in critiquing human relations with other animals. We need to consider systemic relations involving an array of social institutions and practices through which human animals dominate others. We live in a complex world of multiple social relations and an important contribution of sociology has been the increasingly sophisticated mapping of the ways these interact. These are of utmost relevance in understanding the social forms which our relations with non-human animals take. The human domination of other animals exists in a media of multiple systems of social domination. So we who inhibit, inhabit even, the category human, we don't inhibit it enough, are implicated in a system of species domination. But being human is insufficient to describe who we are. We humans have incredibly different relations to non-human animals depending on our geographical and cultural location, our gender, ethnicity and our relationship to wealth. We also, of course, have different relations according to our politics. A critical sociology that is for non-human animals must be a politicised sociology and it is to take account of and present a challenge to the intersected dominations of all the beings on this planet we inhabit.